We believe deeply that we have so much that we can learn from one another. And that's why we bring artists and writers like Saeed Jones to engage with us in their work. Saeed is a highly acclaimed author and poet who has won a push card prize as one of the finest writers from the small presses. He has a new book of poetry out titled Prelude to Bruise. If you follow Saeed's blog, you know he moved to Columbus in 2019. Trading the literary salons of New York City for the patios of Franklin. We are glad that he could join us in representing Columbus to the world. To that end, please give a hearty Zoom wave and welcome to author, poet, social critic, Saeed Jones. Dr. Moore, thank you so much. I'm so honored to be here. And you're right, it's true. I, I do love the barbecue at Ray Ray's and they had Grant and Franklin. To... <laughs> I was there just on Friday. So it's true, it's true because, you know, the salons of New York don't have good barbecue. Um, and so I had to I had to move here. Um, I, I am so excited to be here um, to 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 honor, I feel, you know, um, LGBTQ heritage, and of course, to honor all of you students and, and moral scholars. I'm so proud of you. Um, it is never an easy time to be young in America. It's never an easy time to be queer or to be a person of color in this organized crime we call a country, but it's definitely not easy now. And so I just want to say that I am so proud of you and the work you're doing because being a college student, being a young person in this pandemic, in this um, political climate, whatever you want to call it, it's not easy. And um, so much is being asked of you. And so um, I, I just want to let you know that I am proud. And I'm sure many of your mentors and teachers are too. Um, I am going to read um, from the beginning of my memoir, How We Fight for Our Lives. It seemed relevant. Um, and then I'm excited to have a conversation with Dr. Grace Johnson. And then we can talk. You can ask me questions. And we can talk about the book, how it happened, what happens in the book. We can talk about why I like the barbecue in Franklinton or what it's like being a writer, um, how I pay my bills. It's, it's you know, why, where I got this shirt, Zara, tell no one. Um, it's all game, OK? Um, I guess for context, you know, American history has moved so quickly that I guess like just something you should know is that when the book opens, um, it's the late 90s um, and I'm living in uh, Louisville, Texas, which is a suburb north of Dallas. It's where I grew up. Um, and just remember um, at that point, um, you know, it's still uh, still illegal. Um, sodomy, being caught having sex with someone of the same gender was illegal until technically, um, until I was a junior in high school. That's 2003. Um, and of course, marriage equality was not the law of the land across the country until what, 2013. Um, and this book opens in basically um, 1999. So I'm gonna open the book with a poem, a little prelude, and then I'll read from the first chapter. Prelude. Elegy with grown folks music. I want to be your lover comes on the kitchen radio. And briefly, your mother isn't your mother. Just like if the falsetto is just right, a black man in black lace panties isn't a faggot, but a prince, a prodigy. And the woman with your hometown between her hips shimmies past the eviction notice burning on the counter and her body moves like she never even birthed you. The voice on the radio pleads, I wanna be the only one that makes you come running. Some songs take women places men cannot follow. Spinning, she looks at but doesn't see you. Spinning, she doesn't have time for questions like what is this nasty song? And where did she learn to dance like that? And why and who is this high pitched bitch of a man who can sing like a woman and turn your mother not? into your mother, but a woman, not even a woman, but a box braided black girl, a fast girl, a chick, a vanity six, and how far away she is from you right here in the living room, dancing with the song's hook in her throat. And you hate the voice coming through the radio because another sissy has snatched your dreams and run off with them. And because you are young, and don't know the difference between abandoned and alone. Just like your mother's heart 
won't know the difference between beat and attack. She will be dead in a decade. And maybe you know what you're losing without knowing how. But you're just a boy for now. And your mother is just a woman, just a girl, body swaying, fingers snapping, and snakes in her blood. Chapter one, May, 1998, Louisville, Texas. The waxy faced weatherman on channel eight said we had been above 90 degrees for 10 days in a row. Day after day of my t-shirt sticking to the sweat on my lower back, the smell of insect repellent gone slick with sunscreen, the air droning with the hum of cicadas, dead yellow grass cracking under every footstep, asphalt bubbling on the roads. It didn't occur to me to be nervous about the occasional wall of white smoke on the horizon that summer. Everything already looked like it was scorched, dead, or well on its way. I was 12 years old and I had just finished the sixth grade. Most days, after mom headed to her job at the airport, I would stay inside our apartment, stationed by the window. Cody and his younger brother, Sam, two white boys who lived a few apartment buildings over from us, were always playing catch in the parking lot, though I never joined them. I wasn't good at throwing the ball and it was too hot for me to go out there and pretend. When I wasn't at my perch, acting like I wasn't watching them, I would flip through my mom's old paperback books. Today, I picked up a worn copy of Another Country by James Baldwin, sat down cross-legged on the floor and started reading. A sad man walks through the streets of New York City late one winter night. He goes into a jazz club looking for someone or something, but doesn't say why. Minutes pulled into hours. Black people sleeping with white people. Men kissing men, then kissing women, then kissing men again. Every few pages, I would look up from the book and peek at our apartment's front door. Mom wasn't home from work yet, and I felt like I would get in trouble if she saw me reading this book. I went into my bedroom with our Cocker Spaniel, Kingsley, trailing behind me, and I closed the door. The novel turned me on. I didn't know books were capable of anything like this. Until now, I had liked reading, but it was just something you did. A good thing, like drinking water on a hot day, but nothing special. Holding another country in my hands, though, I felt that the book was actually holding me. Sad, sexy, and reeking of jazz, the story had its arm around my waist. I could walk right into the scene, take off my clothes, and join one of the couples in bed. I could taste their tongues. About a third of the way into the novel, I found a Polaroid tucked between the pages like a bookmark. It was a picture of a man I had never seen before. He didn't resemble anyone in my family, but for all I knew, he could have been a distant cousin or uncle. He was leaning against a sedan with his arms crossed and an arm, odd smile on his face, as if the person holding the camera had just told him an inside joke. Or maybe this man was doing the telling. The smile felt intimate, inappropriate, like a hand sliding down where it should not be. Someone had written Jackson, Mississippi, 1982 on the back of the Polaroid. I decided I didn't like the man in the picture. The dirt on his shoes irritated me, and the longer I looked at his smile, the more it felt like he was looking directly at me. Not at the camera in 1982, but at me, 16 years later. He grinned like he knew something about me, a punchline I hadn't figured out yet. When mom came home from work, she headed straight into the kitchen to pour herself a glass of water from the Ozark jug. That was part of her routine. She'd drink the entire glass right there in front of the fridge. Then she'd walk into her room and stare at the TV for a little bit, listening to the weatherman deliver a forecast. More heat, she already knew. Mom 
was beautiful, but always on the edge of exhaustion. When she was in her 20s, she had worked briefly as a fashion model. Sometimes she let me look at pictures of her from those days, her hair in box braids, her lithe frame draped in gowns her sister had designed, posing on runways. Even a long day of work couldn't deny her the colors her black hair flashed like raven feathers when the light hit it just so. I was proud of her beauty. My first diva. After working at the airport all day, mom was too tired for any of my questions, so I waited until she had had a cigarette. After a smoke, she would be ready to talk. She saw the Polaroid in my hand when I walked up to her. I'd been wondering what happened to that, she said. She held the photo in her hand gently, as if it would crumble to dust if she wasn't careful. Her face softened just a little. Who is he? I asked. She looked out the window at the oak tree right outside our living room. She stared long and hard, like she was waiting for some signal. I stared at the window with her, then arched one eyebrow. She sighed. A friend from school. We'd go on road trips now and then. We went to Jackson once, she said. She paused again, still looking at the tree. For a moment, it was quiet inside the apartment and out, like the heat was making the entire town hold its breath. Then Cody and Sam started yelling at each other again in the parking lot. Mom frowned and turned back to me. Not too long after that, he found out he was sick and, and he killed himself, she said. She was already walking back to the kitchen for more water, which was her way of saying that the conversation was over. It was too hot the day too long. I wanted to see the man's picture again. He had looked healthy to me. He was young, early 20s. And, and what did being sick have to do with killing yourself? Sick with what? I called out, even as I felt bad for asking. I had stepped into someone else's house without their permission, but now that I was inside, I couldn't help looking around. AIDS, she said. Then she breezed into her bedroom and closed the door. I could hear her open a drawer and turn the TV on. I tried to listen for the weatherman's prediction, but the volume was down too low. I went back into my room and pulled another country out from under my pillow. After reading and rereading the same paragraph several times, I set the book back down. AIDS, I thought. Shit. She hadn't even said her friend's name. Gay wasn't a word I could actually imagine hearing my mom say out loud. If I pictured her moving her lips, AIDS came out instead. But in the days following our conversation about that photograph, I could feel the word gay, or maybe the words conspicuous absence vibrating in the air between us. I heard it vibrating in the air when Cody and his friends were playing pickup in the park, sweat making their shirts transparent and heavy, their nipples poking at the fabric. I could hear it too when I thought about the man in the photograph. I wish I still had that Polaroid, but it would have been weird to ask mom if I could look at it again. I wanted to see a smile. I thought I would understand it better now. I carried that man's smile in my head for three days until the smirk became a laugh, a taunt, a howl. One morning as mom got ready to leave for work, I stared at the ceiling, then closed my eyes when she opened my bedroom door to let the dog in. Whenever she left, Kingsley would panic, pressing his face against the window so he could watch her car pull away. It happened five days a week, but each morning he was just as frantic, as if this would be the day she left never to return. With Kingsley yipping at my ankles, I ventured into mom's room. The picture wasn't on her dresser and I thought about going through her drawers to find it. The last time I'd done that though, I found her vibrator. The discovery had been its own punishment. Still, I knew there was a place I could go to get the answers I wouldn't find at home. 
Throwing on clothes without even eating, I opened the front door and locked it behind me. Kingsley barked and scratched at the sill as if he was trying to warn me. In the public library's air-conditioned coolness, I decided I knew better than to ask the wrinkled woman at the circulation desk where to find the books about being gay. Instead, I slowly walked up and down each aisle, scanning book spines until I found what I was looking for. The first book that stopped me was for parents dealing with gay children. The introduction was worded like it was intended for readers coping with a late stage cancer diagnosis. I put the book back on the shelf, wrong side out. Eventually, I gathered five or six books and sat down on the floor with them in my lap. Like any teenage boy trained at reading things he shouldn't be, I looked both ways before opening any of them, then got up and grabbed a decoy book off the shelf. It was a book about the sociology of boys. I kept it open on the second chapter and within reach in case someone I knew came down the aisle and I needed a quick alibi. All the books I found about being gay were also about AIDS. Gay men dying of AIDS like it was a logical sequence of events, a mathematical formula or a life cycle. Caterpillar, cocoon, butterfly. Gay boy, gay man, AIDS, it was certain. Mom's friend got AIDS because he was gay. Because he was gay, he killed himself because he knew he was dying anyway. I read about gay men who were abandoned by their families when they came out, or worse, who didn't tell anyone that they were gay, even when the lesions started to blossom on their skin like awful flowers. Either way, the men in those books always seemed to die alone. I took some comfort in the fact that mom knew about her friend's illness. Maybe he had been able to tell the people close to him. Maybe mom was the kind of person you could tell. When I stood up to put the books back on the shelf, I realized my hands were shaking. I felt like I had made the mistake of asking a fortune teller to look into my future. And now I was being punished for trying to look too far ahead. Walking outside, the blast of hot air was a relief. I passed the park on the way home, and the usual boys were on the basketball court, shirts and skins. I looked at their bodies, but only for a moment. I couldn't really focus. In every man's expression, shimmering amid the heat waves, I found myself searching for the face of the man in the photograph for a hint of that smile, that beautiful, unforgivable smile. Thank you, thank you so much. <laughs> thank you so much, Saeed. Thank you, thank of you course. So much. Yeah. Um, I would like to ask um, everyone who is in the audience now, in the virtual audience, that you send questions that you would like us to ask Saeed um, in the Q&A um, little chat box. Um, and I'll start looking at those. Um, I have to say, Saeed, I am no doctor, OK? I'm Grace Johnson. There's no. <laughs> <laughs> OK, all right. I love that transparency. I just want to be real here. So, uh, I love it. But uh, anyway, it's, uh, it's been a true honor. And um, thank you so much for, for reading the prelude and also for the, uh, for the first chapter of, um, of your book, of your memoir. So to, if you could give some, mm -hmm. tell us a little bit about what's what you're what's coming out next that uh, to brew sure. that yeah but yeah yeah tell us a little bit of course of course so um, I uh, just a couple of weeks ago uh, turned in the manuscript for my next poetry collection so Prelude to Brews was my first book it came out in twenty. Ooh, 14, it feels like a long time ago now. Um, and then I published the, this book, How We Fight for Our Lives, right before the pandemic. Mm -hmm. <laughs> feels like a lifetime ago. And yeah, this, this next book is a poetry collection um, titled Alive at the End of the World, you know, apt. Um, and so, so right now, basically I've turned in the manuscript. I've been working on these poems really for the last few years, but earnestly for the last year. Um, writing usually two or three poems a week. 
wow. um, here at the desk I'm sitting at. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, and so right now, um, you know, based on feedback from my editor, but she's based in Portland, Oregon. Um, and so we, you know, I sent her the work and she spent a couple of weeks with it. And then she gave me some notes because that was a poetry collection um, and it's individual pieces. We still want to have an arc. We still want to have a story. Uh -huh. um, in some ways it's going to be like, kind of like the sequel, like the poetic sequel to the memoir, you know? So my mother passed away um, a decade ago, that happens in the book. And and so you uh -huh. see the book, the, the memoir basically ends, um, you know, six months after my mom passes away. And here we are a decade later right. in this pandemic, so much has happened. So, so basically I'm like taking feedback from my editor and kind of writing a couple of more pieces, maybe three or five more poems to kind of, it's kind of like putting together a collage or a puzzle you know, to kind of finish those last uh -huh, two touches. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. What makes you happiest to write about is a question Ooh. that has come in. What makes me happiest to write about? I don't know if it's a specific topic. Um, you know, I, I like writing about all kinds of things. I mean, I want to write many, many books. You know, I'm a decade into this career. So it's not one particular thing that I'm happy to write about, but the feeling of of, of accurately kind of pinning down a vague emotion or a vague dynamic, being able to kind of nail down that, like, because I think poetry is like, you know, it's about the ineffable. It's like kind of helping us pull together language to, to honor those dynamics or feelings that are just kind of hard. You know what I mean? They're not textbook. And so for me, it makes me happy when I feel like, oh, I've gotten it. <laughs> it almost yeah. to me it, it feels like you know like our emotions are like a like an alphabet and and so it makes me happiest when i found like i've identified a new letter in that alphabet thank you next question mm -hmm. um saeed can you share a little bit about how you built your community in columbus mm -hmm. and any advice you can give to our students on building that community Absolutely. Um, you know, it, I think it first begins with reading. I would tell any young emerging writer and uh, frankly, any old writer, um, <laughs> you know, um, for poetry, for example, I say for every one poem you write, read three poems by other people that humbles you, uh -huh. that lets you know, oh, I'm not the only one whose mom has died. Who knew? You know, you need to know what other people are doing. And but that's also the beginning of community, you know, and so for example, before I moved here, well, before I even realized I was gonna move here, I was reading Maggie Smith's poems. I didn't know where she lived, mm -hmm. you know, but I, I read Good Bones, you know? Um, and in fact, I remember being at a, one of those fancy New York events and I'm sitting in the audience and they had a bunch of actors reading poems and Merle Streep <laughs> comes out and I'm like, oh, Merle Streep, she puts on her glasses and she's like, I will be reading Good Bones by Maggie Smith. I was like, holy shit. You know, I'm like, <laughs> I went on Twitter because I didn't have her phone number. And I direct messaged Maggie Smith like, do you know Merle Streep is reading, you know? And and so when I moved here, you know, Maggie Smith or someone like Hanif, Adurb Keeb, you know, I, I loved his poetry. I loved his essays. I think I knew he lived somewhere in the Midwest. Mm -hmm. But when I decided to move here, you reach out to those people. And because... I always, I try to express my appreciation. When I read an article or a poem or a short story, this is the 21st century. Y'all know we can all find each other, right? You say, thank you. You reach out and you say, thank you. I was having a hard day and I read this essay you wrote and it helped me. And then you never know what might come of that. But what I have found in terms of building community is that you know years later, you might move to a city and you might need advice on where to get an apartment or where to go grocery shopping or where's the good drag show at, you know? And I think that kind of reading life that turns into that life of gratitude can turn into a real community. Because now Maggie Smith and I, you know, once a month we have cocktails. <laughs> wow. <laughs> okay, next, um, and let me um, read. Thank you for the beautiful reading. I continue to marvel at that opening poem and the complex view of your mother. Can you say a bit about the ways decisions are made about mm -hmm. poetry, or excuse me, about memoir mm -hmm. versus poetry collections mm -hmm. versus individual poems 
that won't go into a poetry book. Oh also, yeah. Wow. Okay. Also, mm -hmm. this goes, mm -hmm. okay, because memoir That's a good question. Mm -hmm. often pinpoints particular themes or parts of life, what would lead you to write another memoir? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I'm looking, I'm looking at this question. So it's so good. This is why I love the Q&A feature because I can read it. Mm -hmm. um, the last part of the question is the easiest part. Um, because memoir pinpoints particular themes and parts of life, what would lead you to write another memoir? I pray I do not have any more life events that warn another memoir. <laughs> <laughs> I pray that my life is so happy and so boring that I'm like, nah, no one would read this. <laughs> um, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, to write another memoir, I, I think, you know, all of our time is very valuable. We've got a lot going on. And so I think it, it's, it's a big ask to, to, to ask for readers to like read a book, to read about your life. You know, I don't think that's something I should just assume people want to do. So I would really have to have something to say. With this memoir, I was like, you know, uh, you know, I think when we think of coming of age stories in America, it's it's too many white boys, <laughs> it's too many white people in the suburbs. There's not enough kids of color. There's not enough brown and black kids who kind of get to have their coming of age story. Um, there's not enough queer kids who get to have their story centered as like an all, this is a very like all American book. And at the time that I started writing this memoir, I, I didn't see it out there. So that's why I wrote How We Fight for Our Lives. So I guess I would say I would need to have experiences that lead to an idea where I'm like, oh, this is something I can contribute to the culture. And then I would need to feel deeply that no one else is doing it because it's so hard. I would rather just write poetry collections forever. <laughs> writing a memoir okay. is a bit like, um, it's a bit like the triathlon because it's not enough for the writing to be beautiful. It has to be accurate. What was, the, I mean, literally when I say 90 degrees for 10 days, understand I had to pull up an almanac and look up the damn weather in North Tech. You know, like it's a lot, you have to be factually accurate. You know, I, I went back to Louisville, Texas and looked at the layout of the apartment complex to be like, yes, that is, that is where Cody and Sam lived. So it has to be beautiful. It has to be accurate. And then something can be accurate without being emotionally truthful. That's a lot to do, you know? So that's that's it. And then um, a poem, let's see, can you say the ways of decisions about memoir versus poetry collections? So I will say the prelude, I was not going, the book was not going to open with that poem. It, it wasn't going to be a part of the book. It kind of came late. Um, I, I, a mentor of mine, and she just won, um, the Ruth Lilly Poetry Prize for her career work, Patricia Smith, black woman poet and icon. Um, she's a big fan of Prince. And, and one year AWP, the, the writing conference was in Minneapolis where Prince is from. And, and she has known me since I was a junior in college. And she said, I wanna have a party. Everybody's gonna write a poem about Prince and then we're gonna get drunk and we're gonna dance to Prince songs all night long, you know? And I was like, Okay, and, and I was like, oh, I remember my mom dancing too. I wanna be your lover. That's how that poem happened. Um, I didn't think it would be a part of the book because it, I don't know, it was just, it existed on its own. But basically when I was in revision and I kind of saw how my mother exists in the book as a, as a parent, as a medical patient, um, I realized that you don't get to see her as a woman. It was really important to me that my mother had value and integrity and worth just as a person. You know what I mean? And, yeah. and so I realized, I was like, how do I, how do, I do this? Because I was like, mm -hmm. kid, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't write scenes where I wasn't present, right? I don't know what her life was like at work, you know, at the airport or whatever, you know? And I was like, oh, I have this poem <laughs> that's right. about me, you know, seeing her dance and kind of, that moment where you see your parents and you're kind of embarrassed by them because they're so, you're like, what are you doing? What is that? <laughs> right. Yeah. You know? So it was just such a human moment. And that is why I decided to include the poem because it was showing something important um, that I couldn't figure out how else to work into the book. Mm -hmm. Thank you. We're having um, questions going, okay. you know, coming in fast and hard here. Okay. Let me do the lightning uh, round. 
<laughs> Here's one. Every writer seems to go through imposter syndrome during the writing process. If you experience that, what methods or tools do you use to move past it? Hmm. Um, I don't think I don't think I really experienced the imposter syndrome. I'm pretty arrogant. <laughs> Okay. Uh-huh. I just, you know, you know, wonderful um, podcast that used to exist by um, uh, Heaven and Tracy, you know, they, it was called Another Round, and they would say kind of live with the confidence of a mediocre white man. Live with the confidence of a mediocre white man. I, I, I think, you know, writing and publishing is hard enough. I mean, I start, like, this opening chapter I wrote when I was in graduate school. So... I wrote that opening chapter almost a decade before the book came out. It's a wow. long journey, wow. you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And so I just tell people like, just write, just write, just mind you, don't worry about what people will think. Don't look for permission, just do the writing that you care about. And with time, I believe people will appear and honor your work. Um, and then they will help you put it out in the best light possible. I trusted that. I trusted my agent would tell me if the book wasn't ready. I trusted that my editor, you know, would give me feedback. So I didn't worry. I just felt like this is hard enough. And the one thing I'm not going to worry about <laughs> is uh -huh. that. I just okay. think imposter syndrome is trauma. And, and we need to get over it because all it does is slow us down. You know? Thank you. Thank you for mentioning that there is not as many queer and uh representation and writing and be pop can you share any readings that you recommend for us to read oh can i um let's see i'm literally i'm literally just turning to the books that are like on the floor i'm right now I'm, look at this look at how this i oh baby woo -hoo -hoo. i haven't marked up a book like this in graduate school this is afro pessimism okay by frank b wilderson um he writes like a poet but he has a background in, in kind of critical race theory. Um, get this book and then get it, read it with a friend because it's so intense and mind blowing. You're gonna want someone to talk to about it. Who else? Afro Pessimism. Afro Pessimism by okay. Frank B. Wilderson. Mm -hmm. okay. um, her, it's over, her book's over there, um, but In the Dream House, um, that is a memoir by Carmen Maria Machado. Carmen Maria Machado. Um, it is a book, um, she is queer, she is Latina, um, and it is a book about her experience as well as the cultural phenomenon of abuse um, and violence in queer relationships. You know, like just as I felt like we don't have enough queer coming of age, I don't think we have enough people kind of examining and honoring violence among our own relationships. And, and when, when you don't have that blueprint and then it happens to you as a queer person, you're kind of like, what do I even do? You know? And so I think In the Dream House by Carmen Maria Machado. And then let me see, hmm, let me, I'm looking around, I'm looking around. I see The End of Policing um, by Alex Vitale. That's really good. Defund Police, Defund Police. Um, End of see. policing. Okay. Uh huh. Oh, and then one more. Okay. Okay. This is really good. Wait. 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 Okay. This is a graphic novel. I always think people need to read beyond the genres they're from, familiar with. Um, and so I don't know a lot about graphic novels, but this is. Um, it's called Safe Sex, um, by Tina Horn. I know it's like kind of hard to read because of how the title looks, but it's Safe Sex by Tina Horn. It's a graphic novel set in the near future. It's kind of like Handmaid's Tale. But just imagine that America, like 10 years from now, is taken over by fascists who are anti-sex, anti-queer, anti-porn. <laughs> and so the, so, so the, the, the characters, and this is all the main characters, they're, they're, it's a group of sex worker rebels and revolutionaries who have to kind of fight back. And um, if you've read Margaret Atwood's The Handmaid's Tale and it called to you and you thought it was interesting, but you were kind of like, queer people aren't really centered, people of color aren't really centered, sex workers aren't really centered. This is a nice answer to that. And it's a, you know, it's a graphic novel. It's cool. Right. Yeah, those are some examples. Thank you. Um, do you see yourself being influenced by other writers? Mm -hmm. And how much do you think your writing is inspired by others? 
Oh, constantly. I mean, I, I think, and I believe um, Toni Morrison said this, that, that writing really is just an elevated form of reading, you know? And so when I, when I hold up, you know, uh, Afro-pessimism, you know, it, it all starts with me highlighting and making notes, and then it goes to me making notes in my notebook, and then one of those notes is still with me. Sometimes it's just a word. Um, you know, lately I, I wrote a poem finally with the word obliterate, <laughs> because obliteration kept popping up in different things I was reading, and then I build a poem around it. So yeah, I there is no writing without reading. And I can tell when either emerging writer, or like I said, even like a like a famous established writer, I can tell when someone's not reading other people's work. I can tell when a straight man is out here trying to write a novel that has women characters and he ain't re read nothing <laughs> by a woman. And it shows up, you know, and I'm like, that is not how a woman would feel about, you know what I mean? It shows mm -hmm. up. And so I think anything I've done well in my writing, of course, I believe I have talent, I have intellect, but it is colored and brought to life because I exist in community with other other writers. I, that's that's it. I, how would you learn to dance without watching other people dance? You know, it's that's what it, it's a back and forth. Mm -hmm. Hey, another. Okay. Your memoir is one of the most vulnerable I've ever read, and I listened to the audiobook. I'm curious oh. about your experience recording your memoir and how that <laughs> differed from the writing and the editing process. Yeah. Um, I, people often ask me if I, if, if it was like emotional, uh, writing the book and generally it wasn't except for when I have to write, when I wrote the chapter of my mom having the heart attack and going into the hospital, that was literally the only time in my career, basically, I can think of one other instance where I started crying as I was writing, which is really hard, you know, um, but generally I write cold, you know, like generally I'm like, was it, was it 95 degrees that week in Texas or 80? Like I'm very technical, you know, mm -hmm. I'm like how, what, you know, I'm, I'm really focused on, and maybe that comes from being a poet, the sentence level. I just want to get it right, you know? And so I'm not worried about, oh, it was so sad to see that photograph. I'm just, that's not where my mind is in that moment. And that, I guess that's me compartmentalizing. Doing the audiobook was very emotional. I recorded it in the summer of 2019 in New York um, over the course of two days. And it was about four hours a day, just me yeah. alone, <laughs> yeah. me alone yeah. in a little table with a cup of tea and a bunch of throat lozenges. Um, and yeah, because it's, you know, obviously I do readings, but you know, I select parts of the book. There are parts of the book that are difficult. There's a church scene with my grandmother that comes, you know, a little bit. And and so having to read, you know, what that pastor says and say, oh, it was horrible. Or, you know, there are scenes where I write where I have an argument with my mother and you see it like right towards the end of the book. And it's just like a really tough moment for both of us saying those words out loud. Ah. <laughs> you know, I, right. Yeah, uh -huh. I, I think when you write, you can kind of focus on the craft and the narrative. Am I doing a good job of bringing my mother to life on the page? But when when I had to literally say these painful things out loud, you know, things that I would never want anyone to have to experience, that that was emotional. So it was kind of you, and I, I would like try to hold it together. Then there were two producers outside the audio booth and I would finish a chapter and he would very calmly go, would you like to take a break? Okay. <laughs> and I would like run to the restroom, you know? And then the time that I just lost it doing the audio book was the, and this gets to the previous question about community, about other writers, reading the acknowledgements, reading the acknowledgements at the end of the book where I thank all of the people yeah. I just was. <laughs> I bet, yeah, that must yeah. have been really, yeah. But thank you, I'm glad you liked the audio book. <laughs> Hey, here's a here's another, and I'm I, I know people are telling me um, that I need to keep an idea on the or, uh, an eye on the time. So, so you, this isn't about your book, but it's about okay. an article I read where you shared how much you love Columbus, Ohio. Mm -hmm. Having just moved here to attend OSU and feeling a bit homesick for the coastal mm -hmm. city I moved from, can you share a little bit about your journey of how you ended up in Columbus? and how your love for it has evolved, grown, changed. 
Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, first of all, if you find me on Twitter, you can send me a tweet or a DM and tell me where you're from. And maybe I can recommend some things here that you might like that kind of, um, oh, okay. you know, I, you know, um, in 2014, 2015, I came here for a poetry reading. The city invited me and I, I read for, it was part of pride, you know, the, yep. the June stuff at Goodell park. And I showed up and, and there were so many gay people. Gosh, there's so many gay people. This is incredible. You know, when you live in New York, you think there there are like basically no gay people anywhere else. Um, and so I was like, oh, this is great. And then I came back in 2018 um, for uh, I was working at BuzzFeed News, and we were doing like a road trip series, and it was a gallery hop, and I, you know, it was a wonderful weekend, and I think it was a game weekend, and I just. I don't know. I love the energy. I, I, you know, Columbus, there's like a million people here, but it still kind of feels like a mid-sized town, even though in fact it's a city. There are a lot of queer people. There are a lot of people of color. Columbus is a very diverse city. I was just seeing all these little things that I like. Mm -hmm. And this doesn't make sense for you right now in college, but when you're in your 20s and your 30s and you have to figure out how to pay the bills, and also to continue to do what you love. And poetry does not make a lot of money. You don't get rich on poetry. You shouldn't. People who are getting rich on poetry are writing bad poems. That's all I'm gonna say. Um, and so I, <laughs> I realized, you know, I lived in New York for a decade and it was great, but it was really intense, really expensive, really loud and stinky. Um, and I wanted to live in a place that was not those things and where I could afford you know, to pay my rent. And and so all of those, everything, I just all those little details kind of came together. And I was like, oh, Columbus. And so I came here by myself for a couple of trips and made sure I liked, you know, what I was experiencing. And I did. And I got to tell you, that was, I moved here September, 2019. Obviously we've been through a pandemic. We've been through the summer of uprisings. It's not perfect. No city is, um, but I, I'm so happy to be here. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I have to say, like, again, we were so, like, when I first read your book and then went and Googled you and learned more about you, it was like, oh, my God, he's living here. It just made me feel so proud and happy, you know? So Columbus is still like that. We're kind of surprised sometimes right. when somebody from the outside likes it. I'm mm -hmm. sure you picked that up, right? Yeah. You know, the only, sort of the only place I've been where people are more surprised that a Black gay man would show up and have a good time is Glasgow, Scotland. <laughs> okay, okay. Every time when I was in Glasgow, they would always say, what are you doing in the chateau? And I was like, huh? And I realized with their accent, they were saying, what are you doing in this shithole? They were so <laughs> confused, <laughs> but I loved it. I don't know, you know, I think it's important for us to know as artists, as, as, as um, writers, there are all kinds of places we can be happy. And they might not all be advertised, you know, there might not be like, you know, all that kind of stuff. But I really do think if you live curiously, passionately with an open heart, you can find your people, maybe anywhere, maybe not everywhere, but in a lot of places. And, you know, Columbus is great. When did you know that writing was what you wanted to do? Mm, I mean, was it college? Your Okay, so it wasn't your wasn't the sixteen year old self in the in the memoir. It was it was in college. No. Yeah, I mean, because I, I enjoyed writing. Um, you know, I kept doing it. But and and I think this is true. I mean, don't raise your hands. You don't have to expose yourself. But I think it's fair to say throughout, you know, high school and college, like a lot of people, we have our diaries, we have our notebooks. I didn't because I didn't have. I was a first generation college student. I didn't know people who were editors and real writers. And in school, all the people they taught were dead white men, frankly. Mm -hmm. So I didn't understand the pathway. I thought I would be a, become a professor or a teacher. And I did for a little okay. while. But yeah. in college, um, my junior year, um, I, I started taking some poetry workshops as an elective, you know, to fill out my gen ed, whatever. Mm -hmm. And um, Tom Hunley, he was a poet. He became my thesis advisor. He was like, no, you're, you should keep doing this. You know, he, he was the kind of, he was the first person to say, this isn't, this doesn't just have to be a hobby. Like you, you were actually on your way. You, you got a lot to wow. learn, but okay. this is serious. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? And yeah, I, I didn't, I just didn't know. <laughs> yeah. And so I uh -huh. changed my major and, uh, and then I just, and then there was no turning back. I was pretty, pretty all in. Mm -hmm. Wow. Um, I am wondering, I saw a flash, Dr. Valerie Lee, are you out there? Okay, maybe not. I, 
like I said, it's a little bit um, intimidating, Saeed, because I've been watching some of the people. There were some like heavy duty people from our department. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <my God>. you, know, <laughs> you know, I was like an international studies major, right? Oh, I love it. I love it. <laughs> Back in the day. So um, I was just wondering, um, Dr. Valerie Lee, if she's, if she's a former chair of the Department of oh. English. Yeah. And oh. I don't know if she's out there or whatever. Or she's probably just saying, Grace, would you just stop making a big deal out of it or whatever <laughs> but um <laughs> if there's anybody else out there from any from any of our different communities at ohio state who wants to put in a question or at this point i think i've got um okay there was one here that i missed you said on twitter and then i think this mm -hmm. is maybe the last question because we're going to need to um close um mm -hmm. and hand it over to robert you said on twitter that you've already started working on your fourth book can you talk oh. about it a little mm -hmm. bit, or is it too early in the process? Do you mm -hmm. get superstitious about talking about projects <laughs> before they reach a certain point of development? Um, I don't know if I get superstitious. I, I do think you want to be, you know, careful before, before you sign contracts, <laughs> uh -huh. you know, and all that kind of stuff. Um, what can I say about the next uh, book? So that's after the poetry collection. Right, exactly. First of all, I will right. say, I will say I am building the Saeed Jones Marvel Cinematic Universe. <laughs> and I'm very excited, a bunch of different projects, not just in books, um, are related and building off of each other. Um, this fourth book will be prose. Okay. Um, and it will be about culture. It will be about identity and art, race and queerness, all the things I care about. It's not gonna be a memoir. Okay. I am writing it, <laughs> um, and I will just say uh, it's insane. It is the most chaotic, wild. I'm trying to really have fun. I, I, yeah. I, I realize that I'm very fortunate, and I think at this point, I think I can write anything I want, and that people will be at least mildly interested in it, and oh, yeah. and publish. And I like, and I know that it will be published by someone. I don't know by who, but I, I, I feel at this point, if I say, here's my nonfiction or my prose book, someone will you know, enable me to publish it. And so I was like, what will I do with all that power? And I decided to try to write something as bold and crazy as if no one was paying attention. And it's very chaotic. Okay. <laughs> I love I that, I love chaos. <laughs> Me too. My agent was, I sent it to my agent. My agent's wonderful. Her name's Charlotte Sheedy. She was Audrey Lord's agent. She's the executive oh. of Audrey Lord's estate. She is a heavy hitter. She doesn't play. And I sent, you know, the idea and everything for her and some sample chapters. And she said, what you're doing is naughty and funny and I love it. So that's, wow. that's what you get. That, that, that's, that's, that's very encouraging. <laughs> Well, Saeed, before I turn it over to um, to Robert, who is the director of the Moral Scholars Program, I just want to say on behalf of Ohio State, but very much on the on behalf of the Office of Diversity and Inclusion, um, come on over. I'll find you a place. Okay? Please. <laughs> you know? I would love um, that. We, we've got a, a, a wonderful building. It's uh, the best place on campus, in um, my humble opinion. But um, it's it's such an honor. And like I said, if you've been feeling stalked, it's me. I, I fully I admit it. I've been trying to, <laughs> you know, so find you in Columbus. And it, it's a true honor and delight to for you to have spent this time with us. And I, I really do mean it. Um, we'll uh, we'll find room. You want to come on over? Or I would. Teach I would <laughs> love to come hang. I'll come hang anytime. You got to come hang that. at very least, okay? <laughs> because you're not far away from us, and at true. least you know to come and and see where we are. Um, but um, truly, thank you so, so much. Thank you um, for having me. This was so fun. And you've got a fun. fabulous laugh. I love that too. So <laughs> you're, you're the best. <laughs> so I'm, gonna, I'm going to uh, mute myself and hand it over to Robert to close us out. All right, thank you, Grace. On behalf of the Office of Diversity and Inclusion, um, I thank you for joining us this evening um, for this enlightening dialogue with Saeed Jones. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. I love your energy, Saeed. Um, <laughs> so to you, um, I thank you for sharing your insightful and inspiring stories with us. Um, you're a testament to the amazing local talent we're fortunate to have here uh, in Columbus. 
So let's give them a hearty Buckeye virtual applause. <laughs>